of things within the task force which was established by the European Commission and uh, you know around these issues you know we had a lot of debate and um, the in so far you know from the European Union the debate moved into the Internet Governance Forum already a couple of years ago there was the first session on Internet of Things in the third IGF in Hyderabad pushed by um, nice friend Francis Muguet from France and unfortunately he died a little bit later and uh, we had no sessions in 2008 but in 2009 we had a session on the Internet of Things in the IGF and since that we are um, continuing the debate and uh, circling around uh, this issue to find out what it is. So before I give a very brief introduction into the subject and what is the purpose of this meeting, let me introduce the panel because we have some changes here on the panel. So we have, um, I start from the left side, we have Nardo, he's from a civil society organization in Indonesia, from our host country and as you know some of the concerns on the Internet of Things has been raised by civil society groups in particular if it comes to privacy. Then we have Jakko Arko, he is from Finland and he is now the chair of the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. And the Internet Engineering Task Force plays a tremendous role in um, uh, doing some uh, protocol work uh, also uh, with regard to elements of the IETF and uh, I'm very interested to hear what uh, the IETF is doing and will do in the IETF field. Uh, then we have on my right side Hossein Batran from uh, Egypt. He's from Isaac Egypt. He will give us a third world perspective. He works with uh, the IT agency also, which is uh, related to the Egyptian government. And on the right side is Peter Denker Trush, uh, who was the chair of the ICANN board for many, many years. And because domain names and numbers uh, um, are the main issue of uh, was the main issue of ICANN and in the domain in the in the Internet of Things we are dealing also with uh, names and numbers more with numbers than with names and so it would be interesting to hear whether there could be any similarity between um, the management of the DNS and some elements in the, related to the Internet Things which are called uh, ONS the object numbering system. Um, we have Sandra Hoferichter here, she managed the um, uh, remote uh, participation. Um, okay, anyhow, so, uh, she is the, uh, the, the, then the organizer and will help uh, also with the discussion from the floor. So this is a really um, a discussion panel. So we do not have prepared any long statements. Uh, because the issue of Internet of Things, as I said, is not yet defined. And here. Mr. Komarov comes from Moscow, probably you can <coughs> take a seat uh, because he was also in a workshop recently in Leipzig. He's from the Moscow uh, Economic University so that we have also the Russian perspective. And as he told us just a couple of months ago, the Internet of Things issue is also growing up in, the, um, in, the, um, in Russia. So let me give you the, a little bit of historical background for this debate. Uh, it started probably in the early 2000s when uh, the RFID chips were introduced and uh, probably it became clear that uh, with an RFID chip you can link objects to the internet. So the RFID chip is a little bit more than a barcode, uh, an ex ex extended barcode and to combine now an IP address with an RFID chip you know, enables that you can link objects to the internet. Um, during the World Summit on the Information Society, Internet of Things didn't play any role. But after the end of the World Summit, the French government in Europe uh, discovered this as a special issue and, you know, pushed a debate uh, whether the Internet of Things needs a special policy, a special governance structure. And there was a um, huge conference, I think in 2008, in Nice, in France, uh, where um, a debate was, is there a need for something like an icon for the um, uh, Internet of Things to manage the object numbering system. And the European Commission sponsored a number of research projects finding out whether a policy is needed for the Internet of Things. 
The problem started that there was no definition of the Internet of Things, and immediately you had two different schools. One school argued the Internet of Things is a special thing which needs special policies, regulation, and something like that. And the others argued the Internet of Things is just an application on top of the domain name system, probably, on top of something else. So there is no significant difference from the Internet of Things from a policy perspective to other um, applications or services like search engines or cloud computing or you know social networks or whatever in particular if it uh, you know issues like privacy was uh, was uh, discussed there is certainly a privacy uh, problem in the internet of things in particular if the objects meet the subjects and the, the rendezvous point creates probably some concerns about um, uh, privacy uh, protection but uh, you know in the Nairobi uh, IGF we discussed whether there should be you know special rules for privacy protection in social networks and privacy protection in search engines and privacy protection in internet of things privacy protection in the internet general and the conclusion was that it makes no sense so that means that is uh, we have a privacy challenge you know in the internet so but uh, there should be not specific privacy regulation for each of the applications so uh, probably you can you know in, in a special application you have a very special problem which needs additional you know elements of, of management or whatever but there is no need you know to create uh, to create this big thing the debate in the European Union continued until the year 2012 Jakob was also in the in the task force and then it ended you know it died just, you know, it was um, no real final conclusion because there was no agreement about this so uh, the European Commission has restructured uh, I invited um, uh, a person from the European Commission, but um, for the moment the European Commission has uh, not uh, an expert in this field anymore and they said, okay, we, we have only three persons here in Bali and we cannot send anybody to this workshop. So that means for the moment the um, European Commission, which was the driver of the debate for a couple of years, so has stepped aside. On the other hand, Internet of Things is a big issue. A recent report released by, Rick, uh, by Cisco said that in the year 2020 there will be around 50 billion objects related to the Internet. And this will be a huge market, a billion dollar market. And uh, just recently there was a conference in Washington in the National Press Club where around 200 people, mainly from the industry, came together and said, you know, this could be the next big thing, you know, with um, all kinds of new opportunities. So that means what we have here is really a, a new territory, uh, a field which is not yet fully understood, which has no definition, but uh, obviously we see a lot of, you know, developments where you see new opportunities to link the 50 billion objects, you know, uh, to the Internet is certainly a challenge, it, it is a big market. So all efforts to define the Internet of Things so far has failed. So there is no accepted Internet of Things definition. And so my, my the start here uh, would be that I just um, would ask around, and I welcome also Martin Bodermann now. He is sitting there from the uh, from another project now from the European Commission. He is uh, from the Netherlands, and so that means I hope that he will uh, participate in the debate very actively. So my first question is to the panelists: What is your understanding of the Internet of Things? Is this just, you know, and? a nice um, slogan for something which cannot be defined. Is this separate from the Internet or is this just an application like we have hundreds uh, of other applications? And uh, probably I start with Jakob. Yeah, so um, just to clarify a little bit why, why I think I'm on the panel, I, I've, um, I am the IETF chair, but not, not so, so much talking about that role today mostly because I have some experience in this, this field with uh, research and being a hot priest in Internet of Things area and some business issues at, at my uh, day job at Ericsson and, and some standards as well. So, so my perspective on this, this question is, is really that, uh, uh, you know, uh, as was noted 
before. Um, some, some years ago, there was a lot of interest on, on the Internet of Things, and, and it was m many people looking at it from the angle of, of it being different. And we had you know, future uh, or Internet of Things research projects that had, you know, ha had a, a program where step one was redesign the Internet. Um, and and I, I think we've come a long way since then. People are now perhaps more realistic and, and understand the value of existing networks and how easy it is to deploy in existing networks compared to, to building some, something completely new. Um, so, so, so what we by and large today see is, is like you know, if you look at the actual products and deployments and what people are building, it's 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 using. You know, largely existing techniques, um, you know, it's, it's IP and, and uh, web technologies and wireless LAN and cellular and uh, all, all the good things and some optimizations and some new things as well. The ITF is working on some things, um, optimizing the web stack. Um, but um, so from, from at least from a governance and administration regulation perspective, um, I think that that follows largely the, the technical situation as well. So we, for, for the existing technologies, we have lots of mechanisms for um, governing, addressing um, MAC addresses and um, you know, data protection. EU has some laws about that and so on. So, so the many different types of mechanisms that are generally applicable in, you know, at least from my perspective, that those probably apply here as well. So the Internet of Things, from my perspective, is not something special. It's, it's already out there. You can buy stuff, and, and it just works in the current Internet. Thank you. Uh, Michael, um, what happened in Russia since our last discussion? Uh, thank you very much, Robin. So uh, I'm not sure that uh, happened much since your last meeting. But anyway, in terms of... Uh, understanding of Internet of Things. Now, uh, you know, our vision, um, I absolutely agree with, uh, with Jakob that, um, anyway, Internet of Things as a concept already exists as a combination of uh, policy issues uh, and technologies, it doesn't. As uh, we do have only technological side already developed, but we uh, don't have uh, let's say soft side developed uh, at the moment and that's I guess uh, that's the reason why we are discussing it here today yeah so thank you okay uh, by the way I welcome Christoph Steck from Telefonica um, who is also a panelist but you know we have only a limited number of chairs here and I welcome also Michael Nelson from Georgetown University and Microsoft who was recently in this Internet of Things conference in Washington. And uh, Michael, I would also ask you the questions, you know, what is your understanding of the Internet of Things? But before I ask you in the um, audience, then I ask um, uh, our friend from Indonesia, from a civil society perspective, Nardo. Uh, is the Internet of Things something special for you? Um, thank you. Actually, I'm not an engineer, so my answer will be very quick and short. Um, I will say that IoT isn't only an application, but uh, more a new technological approach. Uh, the way we see things and IoT point of view is like uh, a lot of things could be mobilized with the help of the internet. That's all my thought. This sounds very reasonable that it uh, gives us more opportunities. So I turn to my right. Um, what's saying? Uh, your first definition of the Internet of Things. Um, first, thank you much, Wolfgang, um, for the... Uh, yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Wolfgang, for the kind invitation to join this uh, exquisite panel. Um, honored to be here. Um, certainly, Internet of, Things, Internet of Things is, from my point of view, an expansion to the, to the current Internet, poses uh, challenges in terms of uh, traffic volume, in terms of um, technologies adopted, in terms of routing protocols, uh, and challenges of, uh, the, the mentioned also in terms of privacy of the collected information. Um, the, the interest... I'm, so, I'm sorry, could you speak next to the microphone, please? We're not hearing you in the back. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, it helps be close to the mic. 
Um, I repeat quickly what, what I said is that um, we see, uh, personally see the Internet of Things as an um, expansion to, um, to the uh, current Internet, posing uh, challenges in terms of uh, much more increased traffic volume. We heard number of devices that would be connected. Uh, we're talking billions of devices versus much smaller number of inhabitants on, on Earth. Um, and we talk about traffic volume increase, challenges to routing protocols, quality of service, as well as issues of privacy of information. The interest that, that I come from, from my part of the world where I live in Egypt, in the Middle East, and developing countries in general, is um, really the use of Internet of Things, not so much to better the quality of life of individuals, but more to address economic and social issues. And these are the challenges that, uh, that we see technology and materializing in machine-to-machine -machine communication as part of Internet of Things can help countries like, like ours develop solutions and, and approaches that can address economic challenges. I believe I can speak to these more during the course of the, of the session. But we see Internet of Things really as an opportunity to help resolve economic and, um, and social, more economic certainly, issues that, that, that we have. Thank you very much. And you gave us already the, uh, the key word, it's the opportunity, but before we discuss the opportunities, I will ask Peter, uh, uh, what is your understanding of this beast internet of things? Well, thank you, Wolfgang. Just, uh, I'm the South Pacific uh, component, and what's a very international panel, well done for putting together a complete range of uh, continents in discussing this. As Wolfgang said, I'm the former chairman of ICANN, and so I'm bringing a perspective about the management of names and numbers to this. Um, and I'm going to take the same kind of position that my colleague from the IETF uh, has taken. Uh, I, there's no doubt that this was, when it emerged, a very intellectually stimulating prospect. Um, it con continues to be an incredible application and use of the internet that's going to lead to enormous differences in the way we live. Our cars will be connected, our, even our gardens will be connected, our refrigerators, trees will talk to each other, and this will go across the entire planet and eventually it will become interplanetary. So we're looking at, at an incredible expansion of the internet as a concept. But the question for me is, does it lead to um, different governance structures or different rulemaking? And I think that's what you're asking us uh, to cover today, Wolfgang. And the answer to me is, well, no, it doesn't. It, it does have uh, issues of volume and traffic, uh, et cetera, but we're still talking about a domain name system, We're still talk which is a mapping between a, a, an alphanumeric, previously man-readable system into the IP addressing system. Now, we may see less of that in terms of human-readable. There's no reason why the domains that are going to be used need to be readable by humans. But there will still be a mapping uh, to the IP addressing system. Is there anything in the addressing system that needs to be changed? Well, no. If we move to IPv6, we're going to have 370 trillion, trillion, trillion addresses, more than there are atoms in the known universe. So we're not going to run out of IP addresses. So all of these different um, items and objects are going to be able to be connected. It's not a con connectivity problem. So um, I'll probably stop there, Wolfgang, but it seems to me that in terms of what we've got in current systems, and we'll talk perhaps more about other issues, but they're the same that come up with other applications. Uh, that there's going to be privacy issues. There's going to be hacking issues. If your car is now controlled um, by, these IP, uh, by these computers that are connected, uh, the, the risk of you being driven somewhere where you don't want to go uh, or someone hacking into your home systems obviously increases. But those are the same privacy, security, crime issues that we face with other applications. Thanks. Thank you very much. And may I ask some of the uh, experts in the room who has been invited before to the panel just to give their perspective before we moved into a broader discussion. Christoph, probably you can say some words. Yeah, thanks very much. And, uh, and sorry for being a little bit late. But, uh, um, uh, thanks for the chance to, to say something from Telefonica's perspective. I mean, I, I, would, I would mirror what was said earlier. Um, we see it as more as a chance, um, an opportunity, uh, than as a risk, uh, as a starting point. Um, and I think we also can live with the current frameworks we have on the policy side to deal with that issue, uh, given the fact that most of these uh, issues will be around privacy and security, and as long as, as the, pri the privacy and security frameworks uh, are up to that challenge, obviously. But, um, 
I think we can go on a, on a case by case basis regarding the products um, we're finally speaking about to, to challenge that. I mean, just to give the example, we, we spoke about connected cars. I suppose that connected cars, thinking about privacy and location data, uh, it's a different issue than a smart meter, which is located always in the same place, which is basically a house. Um, so there might be not the same uh, sensibility around some of these issues and in some of the products as in others. So this is why we believe it has to be a more case by case basis regarding the the final application, and we are just at the beginning of seeing these coming up. And we're just in the beginning. We, uh, my company just won the first contract in the UK to equip all the houses with smart meters to become, you know, smart uh, electricity and gas networks and these kind of things. So this is, I think, very important. I think talking about one challenge, the challenge is these are global products, okay? We're not speaking uh, national, we're not even speaking, let's say, US, Europe, or something like that. We're speaking national, uh, global um, product, and so we need to have kind of some form of global uh, system to deal with that. Uh, uh, these devices will be moved around the world. We're in a globalized world, as you know, so we will have a challenge maybe on the international side of, of these frameworks. Thank you, Christoph. I think you said a very important um, uh, word, which was case by case. So uh, even if you see a smart car, you, uh, it's one device, but you know it has different elements. And probably if you link the whole car to the net, could raise the risk very high. And you're, within the car, you have uh, non-risk parts and risk parts. So the engine is probably a risk part, but the entertainment system is a non-risk part. And probably to be online during uh, when you are driving and your entertainment uh, collapses, then you could, this could be repaired on the fly. But if somebody hangs in your engine, this could create a high risk. And in so far, uh, we should uh, probably, if we try to define the Internet of Things or you know, have, have an understanding, we should really broaden our understanding. It cannot be just say that it's objects, so that means the different categories of objects you know, will need a special uh, I would not say treatment, but but a special approach, and I think this is probably also the part what we are discussing in a new uh, uh, European Commission project where Martin has a certain lead. Probably Martin Bodermann from um, uh, you can also uh, give us your perspective. Yes, of course. Thank you. Uh, first. Uh uh, I was also part of a project together with Rencorp on um, uh, governance of uh, uh, Internet of Things and, and how to move on with it, uh, recognizing first that it is not an area where you have specific uh, 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 regulation needed, as, as, as Wolfgang said. I think they've moved on. They understand that. Second, it is a very important focus on some of the uh, frameworks that you have in place for competition, but also for privacy and, and, and obviously for security. I think uh, several examples were given already. The most recent news was that uh, apparently John Kerry disconnected his pacemaker from the internet for obvious reasons, and uh, uh, considering uh, him to be part of the Internet of Things uh, was a novel concept, but uh, he stepped back from that. Um, so that's first and for all. I think. Uh, if you look to the real issues that are mostly affected is indeed privacy, big data, um, whereas uh, we've had a lot of web applications where you could opt out if you don't want to be part of it. How are you going to opt out of an ambitious environment uh, with Internet of Things? How are you going to deal with that, that kind of stuff? You need to have a discussion on that because saying, well, let's not have it is not good enough because there's a lot of good in it as well. So how do you deal with that? And that discussion needs to be hit uh, head on. And I think that that will be one of the, the, the things we, we're going to talk about over the coming years. For the industry, I think the opportunity lies very much in designing in privacy, designing in data protection, uh, making sure that uh, sharing is only happening in anonymous ways or, or, or not, uh, things like that. So I think uh, th this is a big area. And the other one is, of course, the realization that we don't only talk about observations, but also about actuation, things doing things. So if something does something, who is responsible for it, and how do we going to deal with that in the society? Uh, that's also, I think, another subject for the coming years to, to answer. 
And thank you. And uh, may I mark, uh, ask uh, Michael Nelson, because um, the Federal Trade Commission in the U.S. will organize a big conference at the end of November or, uh, on the Internet of Things. So I remember discussions with uh, the Department of Commerce, and in particular Fiona always argued, you know, there is no Internet of Things, so it's just the Internet. So I invited Fiona, but unfortunately she couldn't make it to come to this panel. So, but Michael, um, can you give us a little background? What is the, why we see now a new wave of Internet of Things debate in the U.S.? Just real quickly, uh, I'm going to approach this from two different perspectives. For the last five years, I've been teaching at Georgetown University in the Communications Culture and Technology Program. I was teaching technology, but I learned a lot about communication. And I think what we have with the term Internet of Things is a total communication failure. It's exactly the wrong term to use. The only thing worse was ubiquitous computing. Both of them violate Nelson's rule of buzzwords, which is you only get three or four syllables. So my preferred buzzword is cloud of things, because that actually incorporates what we're really interested in, which is lots of things connected to the computing power to make those things really useful. And as a, a very new Microsoft employee, I just joined two months ago, I'm concerned about that cloud of things because we're not a software company now, we're a device and services company. Particularly as we go through the process of buying Nokia, we're going to be making lots more devices. And all those devices are going to feed into the cloud to provide these new services. And we have to think of this whole thing as an integrated whole. And we have to think of it in, in personal terms as well. We have to start communicating to people that they're going to have a hundred devices in their life that are permanently connected to the net. And over the course of the year, they might use a thousand things that have some temporary interaction with the net. Um, and they're not just going to be sensors. As you said, there'll be actuators, there'll be cameras, there'll be sophisticated $100 devices and five cent devices. Uh, just to finish, I, I do have one very big concern beside our failure to communicate, and that is our failure to think globally. Every discussion of the cloud talks about the need to build a global cloud and make sure data free flows freely. We're not paying enough attention to the barriers that could prohibit us from having a global cloud of things. I'm very worried that we're going to have national boundaries and national barriers to letting these things move across borders and work everywhere. That's, our, that's one of our, our challenges whether it's spectrum or standards or privacy rules, we're going to have to make sure these things have a passport to the world. So just my thoughts. Thank you very much for calling on me. I wasn't expecting it. But uh, let's come back to this issue, you know, whether the global or local and the boundaries and the sovereignty question and all this which is involved and a lot of long list of open issues. But Peter wanted to re react and then I ask uh, people from the floor, you know, to make some uh, questions, contributions, or statements. Thank you, Wolfgang. I wanted to respond to all three of those speakers because they were all raised interesting issues, I think, working backwards, perhaps from, from Michael. Thank you for that. I think, though, the cloud of things is just as dangerous as Internet of Things. It suffers from the same problem in that we are not talking about something new. We're just talking about a change of degree. Sure, we're going to go from having three or four items connected to 50 to 100, but the issues, there's just more of the same kind of issues. It, it, it doesn't need a new system to operate. And coming back, agreeing with, with Chris about the um, jurisdiction is the big problem, but it's the same problem we face that the internet introduced sort of 20 years ago. Um, and I just come at that with a reasonable sense of optimism because we've solved these problems before. When air travel was invented, we suddenly had the problem of who, what was the nationality of a child born on an aeroplane flying from country A to country B? And we've had the same thing even earlier with crimes that occurred on ships in the high seas. And we've developed legal rules to solve those. And we are working our way through developing legal rules to solve what will happen when, as, as Martin said, I think that actuation versus um, uh, observation uh, is, a, is a serious problem. But again, uh, the law in my country has already solved a kind of version of that, which was who is the copyright author when a computer program writes something? 
We've already dealt with the situation where the machine, if you like, is taking responsibility and doing things. The answer for those that are curious in New Zealand is the author is the person who wrote the program that does the writing. It may not be the best solution, but in terms of copyright law, we've actually now found someone to sort of fasten that onto. So my position on this is that these are all the same kind of issues, just larger. And that, does, that means we don't have to have a separate ICANN, for example, to make name allocation rules, and we don't need a separate set of RIRs to manage the addresses that are going to be used for that, nor do we need to go and, and create wholly different legal concepts. We will be dealing with these as we, as we go through. So I'm a, I'm a sort of, I see this as a relatively closed issue, tremendously exciting technically, but not raising terribly many new policy or legal issues. Uh, thank you. It's, it's very good that we immediately enter into a dialogue, but Yaki wanted to reply to you, Michael, and then we come back to you, and then I have one and two, um, one, four. Okay. Yeah, so um, I agree with Peter, of course, um, but I, I wanted to touch on the, the question of the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, cloud of things or the national border problem, and that's actually an instance of a larger issue, which is that we don't just have devices. We also have you know, the cloud or, or the infrastructure and everything else that the device needs in order to be functional. And, and that creates dependencies. And those dependencies have an issue in terms of can I communicate with you know, the you know, thing on the other country maybe. I mean, that, that would be a bad thing if we could, be, be, could do that. There's also other kinds of dependencies. One thing that we struggle in the cellular industry, for instance, that we install, let's say, a you know, um, um, automatic me or, um, automated meter thing, and, and it needs to sit there in someone's home for 15 years and not be touched by anyone, because if you send a technician there, it will, you know, uh, kill the business case. Um, so th that uh, device needs to work for a long time, needs to be, I mean, for cellular communication, you need to have a SIM card, and what if and we have a negotiation issue with the operator that provides the services, then we may actually have to go in and replace the SIM card. So that, I mean, that's one example of a thing um, that, that can cause trouble. And another example, you buy something um, that, that's supposed to last for a long time, let's say a car, and then it needs to talk to you know, seven different services on, on the internet and you know, are they available in, in the next, you know, throughout the next 15 years? I don't know. I, I drive a 23-year-old car, so. I don't think we can do that in the future anymore. Okay, thank you, Michael. Just a very quick response to Peter. The, the reason I'm adamant in saying the cloud of things is a better term is because when you say Internet of Things and the policymaker hears about a problem with the Internet of Things, they try to solve it by looking at the things or by looking at the Internet. When actuality, the solution is probably by doing something different in the cloud. With regard to privacy, we have the Europeans talking about the right to the silence of the chips, as if the solution to privacy in this space is going to be something you do to the actual devices, and we're going to have regulators designing the little devices, the 100 billion little devices. Actual, it's much better to go and do something different in the cloud where all the data is going to live and be processed and be stored and hopefully be protected and, and so I, I think the frame is what we need. We need to look at the whole system to get the right solution rather than saying Internet of Things and getting people all focused at, the, at, at half a problem. Yes, sometimes we have to live with words which has been created and are misleading, but they are there. And uh, the same was a couple of years ago with the digital divide, which was it's a bad terminology, but it has survived. And so over the terminology Internet of Things will survive. And if the Federal Trade Commission organizes a workshop on the Internet of Things, so then it's very difficult to remove this terminology and to yeah. substitute it by something else. Ubiquitous about. computing went away. Uh, okay. <laughs> and uh, and you wanted to respond, and then Itsumi Aisu from Japan. Okay. Itsumi Aisu. You, uh, are we, oh, now I need a list, uh, yeah. Thank you, Wolfgang. Okay. May I? Yeah. Um, my name is Izumi Aizu from Tokyo. Um, I'm afraid I may throw some different, very different views. Like, um, to me, Internet of Things uh, sounded like um, just looking at the devices or maybe objects uh, connected to the Internet, but 
Yes, I agree with Mike that, that the, the word things uh, is bothering, that they don't look at the human dimensions. The beauty of the internet to me, or for us, uh, has been that empowered people. They didn't empower things. And, well, I don't know how many people are interested in this, so, uh, some phenomenon called um, personal fabrication or digital fabrication under the guise of the Fab Labs. How many of you have heard Fab Labs? Not too many, thank you. How about 3D printing or 3D printers? M many more. How many of you have 3D printers at home? No, no. In five years, maybe about 20% of you guys or us will have this. And to me, uh, this started from the MIT's Center for Bits and Atoms, uh, connecting those bits and atoms together with these machines which empower people to make things they like. And it's a whole change of the community of people. It's happening now. We are setting up a new fab lab under my institution soon next month. And, and that changed the game. Um, I'm not going to into the details because it's too early perhaps in this debate, but um, the, yes, the concept of internet things wrong because they don't look at the human dimensions. Now human will be more empowered by having new digital tools and machines, laser cutting machines and sharing data 3D scanner, so to Peter, we can just scan this object and produce, reproduce it and modify it. Whose copyright is it? And how if, it, and there's a lot of open design folks are coming, you know, taking open source ideas into the hardware world. And it's creating a new world. We call it a social fabrication, next big thing to the internet as a whole. I will stop here for the pitch. Thank you. You know, gentlemen there in the back. And then the lady in the back, she was the first one. Hello. Um, my name is Alison Powell, and I'm from the London School of Economics. And um, I have, uh, I'd like to connect with what the, what the previous speaker was pointing out about um, kind of missing the point. I think that there are maybe several um, dimensions along which we would like to clarify what we are actually talking about when we're talking about the Internet of Things. First of all, I think that the idea of an Internet of Things is actually not representative of the general transformation towards moving bits into atoms, as was pointed out um, by the previous speaker. But then there's also the element that we have not considered um, as yet in this discussion, which is the element of the experience of the people who are creating all of not just the atoms from bits, but all of the bits themselves. And um, as there are more devices interconnected, there's more personal data being produced. Um, there are more opportunities to correlate and aggregate that personal data and to create different portraits of, um, of individuals within that ecosystem. And so from those two perspectives, I think I must disagree with this perspective that we don't have to invent any new governance structures. Because in fact, we have a problem of an increasing amount of, of data that is generated by whatever this cloud of things, internet of things, network, real network of networks is actually producing. And I think that is the point at which we do need to have some new discussions about governance and that those new discussions need to include changes in an understanding of copyright and intellectual property on the production side, but also other understandings of um, privacy, um, security, safety uh, in a relational context um, because all of this data is able to be interrelated. So just wanted to add that. Thank you. You know, the panelists will get a chance to reply to this. We collect a little bit more interventions. The gentleman in the, in the front row. Uh, Ian Fish from the BCS, the Charles Institute for IT. Uh, I was really pleased to hear what Michael had to say and now what Alison and uh, Isimi had to say because I've been puzzling about this for some time and of course I should have realized that what we're really talking about is complex systems of systems. Uh, which is which is somewhat different from the internet as it currently is thought about, and uh, bringing the human into it is is a very important part of comp system of systems thinking. So I'm I'm very pleased with what I've just heard, and I also would like to pick up on one particular instance that I realised when Jacob talked about uh, the business case for 15, something that has to be left alone for 15 years in order for the business case to work. 
that made me worry extremely about security, for example, because that's going to have to be a different sort of security paradigm if that's going to remain secure for 15 years, given the rate of uh, update in security terms that we do these days. I don't know what people think about that, but it might be worth uh, thinking about. Thank you. Thank you. Abri. Thank you. Um, I'm in a funny position. I started out believing what many of the panelists said, believing that there was nothing new, believing that Internet of Things was an inappropriate name, believing that IPv6 numbering or something like that would do, believing that we didn't need new governance systems. And I spent a fair amount of time over the last two years trying to defend that position. And, and, and as I've moved on, I, I've come to realize that, sure, the current method of governance is good enough for Internet of Things 0 0.1. Sure, our naming is probably good enough. Sure, IPv6 addresses are probably good enough to get us started and off the ground. But when you look at the, the notion of what these objects are, the, the, the sizes that of, of, of stack and data that they can afford, some of the issues that other people have brought up in terms of the additional problems in terms of data governance and, and the privacy aspects and the fact of the additional problems that these things bring in terms of, of the big data and, and such. It occurs to me that, and that A, Internet of Things is actually a beautiful name for it. It is actually the right name, and whoever came up with it was really quite clever because they saw beyond sort of this first thing, well, but no, they're just stuff on the Internet like anything else. But no, we can figure them into our normal governance, so to call it an Internet of Things is really just an exaggeration. But when you start thinking two, three generations down the line of these ubiquitous, I love that word, ubiquitous objects throughout the world and perhaps beyond our, our, our narrow atmosphere, all in communication, all being tracked, all having data, all having governance problems of some sort. Yes, we may not need to create new law. There's more than enough law to last us for the next several centuries. But in terms of actually dealing with the problems that will emerge out of this new way of dealing with objects in a communicated path, I've actually come to believe that for the Internet Things 1.0, as opposed to the Internet Things 0.1, there's indeed a lot to be done in terms of naming, in terms of numbering, in terms of governance, just about in terms of privacy, et cetera. Just about every aspect we can think of, I think it's going to impose new problems that do require new solutions and that we'll have at the end is something that is certainly gated and connected to the Internet, but is also in some sense an Internet of Things is a thing in itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. By the way, we have also a dynamic coalition on the Internet of Things, and the dynamic coalition will meet tomorrow afternoon where we want to discuss a work plan. So what has to be done, and I think Afi has just given us a list, you know, for the next 10 years. So <laughs> probably a lot of things has to be done, but Michael wanted to react to the lady from the London School of Economics, and then it's you and Janetta and the lady here in the front. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, actually, I just wanted to uh, slightly uh, formulate uh, my opinion on, on what was said. So the thing is that, yeah, it doesn't matter, you know, from my opinion, from, from my side, it doesn't matter whether we are talking about Internet of Things or Cloud of Things. Uh, if we are not considering a uh, you know, number of devices and uh, uh, globalization you know, uh, process itself. Because uh, uh, I, I guess that's why we've got Internet of Things as a just good example of globalization, let's say so. Uh, another thing is that I absolutely agree with Ari uh, in terms of IoT version 1 or IoT version 2, because uh, now we're trying to define what is IoT or we're trying to understand what it is. but until, you know, unless we don't have, um, until we don't have a huge social network of things, um, you know, uh, we wouldn't probably uh, 
speed up the process because uh, that, that's what happened with social networking and I'm, I'm still trying to uh, to be on the side of web3 as there as there you know as the internet of things and uh, as all we know yeah it was web one with just observing you know getting information web two of creating information right and web three is probably internet of things but in terms of this uh, description so IoT version one is just uh, uh, like uh, Yahoo or you know, and other search engines just looking through the things, or uh, three, uh, looking through the things around their, you know, world, just at least one list or database, whatever, and the IoT version two is uh, the social network where things would probably exchange data under our control. That's where human beings should be introduced in terms of uh, regulating a data exchange between things, right? Because it's not about physical things connected to the internet, but it's about data which, uh, which is generated by things. And uh, so I guess it's, it's, it's about uh, uh, focusing on the data generated by things uh, rather than uh, focusing on any hardware or software platforms for that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Yaki wanted to react to Avri and then in a, it's you and then Janet. Yeah, so um, the, the um, question of whether everything that we have is enough or not, so you mentioned IPv6 addresses and other things. Um, I, I think it's clear that the, the internet gives us an ability to create new space very, very easily. So, I mean, we, we create these new identifier spaces all the time for basically for every application. Um, and then the, you mentioned the size of stacks. I, I actually personally think that's really not a big issue. I've seen examples of you know people doing wonderful things uh, with small amount of code in, and memory, and more importantly, uh, where the world is moving to um, you know, more powerful devices, even though they're smaller. It just make make economic sense. Um, but my, my larger point is that the, I, I actually agree with you that there's a lot to be done for every like you know you design I don't know transport application or, or you know, car or something, and you're going to have to decide about stuff like, does this car have a roaming agreement so that you can actually drive from Finland to Sweden? It, you know, normally, I mean, previously, my car can actually go, but I don't know about the future cars. Um, <laughs> and um, and, and my, my, my other point is that, that this is not necessarily so dissimilar to what is already happening on the internet on applications. Look at, you know, some, some example applications such as Facebook. I mean, Facebook did not need anything, any new governance on the internet technology side or on the platform that, that it runs on. But of course, it has lots of internal things that we all debate and, and uh, sometimes worry about. So, I mean, I, I think we need to do that for every application in, in the internet of things or whatever it's called. Thank you. Hi, my name is Anthony Bounch. I'm currently working uh, with an organization called Internews based in Thailand. Um, I agree that in, in terms of infrastructure, we're talking about an extension or expansion of the current internet, and I also agree that it raises the same issues of privacy and security. But I'd like to ask the panelists and participants about the, uh, participants, sorry, about the concept of property and ownership uh, and whether there might be governance issues associated with property. Um, for example, not that long ago, I bought, I bought a mouse, and okay, mice might fall under the kind of broad umbrella of technology and software that's required to run technology and there are issues of intellectual property and copyright associated with software. But in order to turn a light on in my mouse, which was under the wheel of my mouse, I had to register with the manufacturer and I had to download manufacturer software um, in order to enable a part of the mouse that I thought belonged to me. I thought that in a fair exchange for value that I was the bona fide purchaser of that mouse and that it was now my property. Uh, and yet I was being denied access to a part of it. So what happens if we extend that process of activation and registration to, say, a fridge or an oven? Um, will my fridge be subject to terms and conditions of use and an activation request? And how much of my fridge will I actually own or will, 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 that will belong to me? Um, could I sell my fridge to someone else, for example, after having purchased it? Ah, that's a good, good question. So we are becoming integrated into a mechanism where we lose partly the control about ourselves. So that's, that's probably one of the interesting, interesting philosophical or uh, social side effects. So um, Martin and Christopher wanted also to react, but first I want to ask Janet 
Um, probably you can go to a microphone and uh, then um, uh, Christopher and Martin. Let, let, let me as the lawyer of the panel ask what's really partly a legal question and it's, it's the same we've, point as we've been saying. This is not a new problem. These are just extensions of the same kind of closer and closer integration. When I started as a lawyer I could pay $500 for example and buy a set of books and everybody in my chambers could come and use, pick up those books and use them. Then I had to buy an electronic service for those same books for $500 and I couldn't lend them to anyone else in my chambers. I had to buy a special license. So, so we see the development of economic models and people taking advantage of these things but I guess no one here is saying the future isn't going to be full of interesting challenges. The question is are they diff so different that we need to set up a separate working group at the IGF to deal with them and the separate things to look at the um, you know, naming and addressing system, etc., which has been, and my, my point is the future is going to be full of fun challenges, but there are extensions of the same kind of challenges, and that's why I'm confident that we'll deal with them, because we've already dealt with them as they've begun to emerge. Um, I have a question for Yari. Picking up from what Avri said, I want to know about car-to-car -car communication. From what I understand, there is a new infrastructure being developed right now and that the next generation of cars, at least the sort of upper rank ones, will indeed talk to each other. And my question is, what kind of network will that be? You started out by saying that more and more actors now recognize that the existing infrastructure maybe isn't that bad. Does that mean this will be uh, your regular IP infrastructure that will connect cars? Will there be then no more security, privacy, etc. And also, there must have been a debate about that. I can't imagine that all players were sort of um, of the same opinion. Yeah, so um, I, first of all, even though I used the car examples, and I'm necessarily the person who's been working on the transport industry and the car industry to figure out what to do, but I, and, and I, so I have a very you know, vague understanding of what they actually are doing. My understanding, though, is, is that there are different types of solutions and proposals, and, and I, I mean, we don't yet know exactly what will win and, and um, take over the market, or what kinds of solutions, maybe there's multiple. Um, certainly people have talked about like car to car and just uh, sort of autonomous um, self-sufficient uh, communications tools um, and you can imagine some applications where that would be very useful um, and certainly people have have talked about and deployed also solutions where, where there's a sort of internet connectivity for everything and when you go through the cloud to do, do, do other things um, and, and those have different implications but, but it, I mean it's not not necessarily one size fits all answers. I, I think we need to take those debates you know, one, one, one by one. And I, I'm sorry, I don't have the full background on all those situations as, as they are coming. But this brings us back to the case by case approach, but I have now three. Can uh, I just ask from a, one follow up question? Okay, so this yeah. is negotiated outside of the ITF? Well, I mean, the ITF develops general purpose uh, internet technology and then other, other people go and use that if for, for various purposes. It would not scale for any one organization to figure out how to do, you know, internet for the toasters and cars and whatever else. So, I mean, it, it's people, it's industries um, and specific industries like the transport industry, they do have their own forums where they talk about things like how do we use you know, um, yeah, networking within the car, networking out of the car. By the way, that's an interesting point. Probably the internet governance ecosystem gets bigger and bigger by bringing, you know, outsiders who are dealing now with internet issues into the internet governance ecosystem, like the transportation community or the logistics community and other, or the Tedosa community, <laughs> yes. So, but um, I apologize for the lady in the front that here, so that means Martin, Christopher, and Hossein, and then we go back to you and to you. <laughs> yeah, it's a shame we don't have a system that does it automatically, right, Wolfgang? <laughs> uh, I was actually triggered by the comment uh, Peter made about we've got that solved in, in, in Australia, like uh, who's responsible. Uh, but uh, then Azumi said something uh, very interesting. It's the Fab Lab concept. And basically, 
maybe this helps better uh, explain what I think also where the Commission is thinking. It's, it's what Avri said. Things are going to change and the Internet of Things is going to affect it. Partly we already know and partly we can start working with that. Um, it's all to be within review of current frameworks. Very little with special legislation. Uh, what Peter said, well, we know who's responsible for what the thing does because it has software and that person is responsible for the quality of the software, right? And, and there's somebody who buys it and he's responsible for, for the buy. But the thing with the Internet of Things is that there's also reactions, autonomous reactions triggered by impulses that can be given. And I have nothing to do with what you bought or what you made can uh, generate impulses. So who's done it then? It makes it more complex. Uh, and the system what uh, Avery was telling about also uh, extends, I think, to consumer protection, for instance. If you don't know what your device is doing or what you buy when you buy a device, it's a com consumer protection issue that needs to be extended, not so much uh, Internet of Things uh, uh, issue. So uh, having said that, I think the concept of Fab Labs that was raised is a very good example. It's discovering together how things work, how we can make things work, how we overcome issues, and which issues arise that then need to be addressed, not only in a technical way, uh, but also in a social way, and sometimes even in a legislative way. Yeah, I would like to come back to, to there was a little bit of pushback to the initial points made around there is no need for new laws and no need for new, uh, let's say, also processes maybe. Um, and, and I still think this is right. Um, I think the, the scale of, for example, privacy problems, of course, increase. I mean, if you have even more information about you as a person, obviously, you know, the privacy issue becomes bigger and bigger. And that's why we have privacy debates um, happening everywhere. Um, and I think that um, I will have a, a thesis here, and, and it's maybe a little bit uh, provocative, but maybe the Internet of Things might even improve that in the end. Um, and I would like to explain that. What we currently see is that, you know, devices are produced, let's say, in China, um, and they, they have a SIM card maybe built in, and these devices are then sold across the world. That's why I said, you know, it's a global issue. It's not, you cannot limit that to a jurisdiction. Um, these devices will kind of comply with privacy standards and laws across, you know, the different, um, across the world, basically. However, in many parts of the world, there is no privacy protection, no data protection. Um, in some other parts, for example, Europe, yesterday, the European Parliament even enhanced the privacy protection of Europeans. There might be a much higher standard. Um, and, and so the issue will be that you will have to build these devices to comply with that. And so it might be that they might have an even higher standard built in because they might be sold in Europe or they might be sold in Brazil or in, 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 on the Fiji Islands. So um, I think that, you know, think about it also that way that, um, of course, this will be one of the challenges. And I would just like to say that, um, obviously, um, the best approach to privacy from our point of view would be a risk-based approach. What do I mean with that? If you are um, having uh, smart devices in the health sector, for example, the information collected about you might be much more sensible than, for example, a smart meter. Uh, I mean, to put it in a nutshell, uh, that you do not use energy at 3 o'clock in the morning, well, I mean, this is maybe uh, not such a sensible information as your blood pressure measured every second, every 10 minutes or whatever, you know. So there might be different aspects to the data collected by these devices, which might then decide on the, the protection level of your privacy you might want to have. Um, and you can, I think, uh, it would be wrong to say that, um, you know, these, these information have not different um, scales and, and different importance for you. So based on that, you know, things like do not harm principle. I mean, you need to build these devices, obviously, with a privacy aspect in mind. And second, also, privacy by design. Um, a lot of these things need to be built in a way which already have built-in privacy protection will be, of course, key for these devices. So this is, I think, very important when you debate it, that, you know, the issue that you say there needs, you don't need to do new laws does not mean that you don't need to protect privacy. Of course you need to protect privacy, and it's going to be the key issue. Otherwise, people would not like to have these devices, to put it in a nutshell. Um, and just the very final point, um, a bigger challenge for us, and we are already doing these devices and selling them, is 
um, very simple issues, but they become very, very complex. For example, that uh, there is regulation in the world, in, in countries, which do not allow devices to roam permanently in their country. Of course, you know, as I explained earlier, you know, you do not know when you produce these devices in China if they will end up um, in Brazil or in the United States or wherever. So it can be that they will stay permanently in one country. Um, so these kind of regulations are outdated. And so there are, of course, issues which need to be changed because otherwise, you know, these products will not be uh, commercially uh, viable. Thank you very much. Now, the lady here and then... Uh, no, Hossein. First Hossein. Yeah, he was expected and then you and you. You're sitting in my shadow here. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah. Actually, I wanted to, to address the, the, the point that, that, that was raised about having global solutions to address the Internet of Things uh, opportunity. Um, certainly, um, global solutions can, can, add help, uh, can help address cases, but um, um, I believe more local and regional-based solutions will be needed. The closer we get to the end consumer, to the, the human being, the more tailored and fine-tuned the solutions have to be. Uh, the more we go to the, the network, perhaps vanilla solutions, edge and core based solutions are, are the same everywhere you go to, to a to mobile network or a fixed, fixed broadband network. So here the, the, the habits of, of the user need to be taken into consideration. And um, um, a case, a case in, um, that, that can be made either in the sector of transportation uh, or sector of agriculture or um, uh, food, uh, food accommodation and health services. Uh, for example, the area of uh, transportation. We see um, in some countries, a case, a case in Egypt, that petroleum usage, the subsidy to, to, uh, to import petroleum is in the area order of about 70 billion Egyptian pounds per year, which is 1 billion uh, US dollars. We buy the liter, a liter of diesel by $1, and we sell it subsidized to the Egyptian consumer by one Egyptian pound, one-seventh of its value. So here the, the subsidy value is quite huge and requires a solution that will make sure that it is targeted to the, re, the individual who really needs the subsidy and not to everybody as not, not stolen and transported outside the country. So these solutions in the, the distribution chain and then in the usage, the car, the car usage itself, the transportation system, um, are, are yeah, need to be tailored to the environment and the scale, number of cars, driving habits, the type of roads that do exist where the solution is deployed. Um, it is good that we can utilize globally based solutions, but I think the work that will be done in fine tuning it to the local environment will be quite, quite huge. And I see this as an opportunity to help develop um, technology and solutions that are locally developed. Um, we need to look at the mobile application paradigm where basically developers for mobile apps and smartphones exist anywhere in the world with an internet access. They can develop an application, they have the APIs that they can test it and then can be adopted by, by the giants of the mobile devices. I think the next challenge will be developing applications for embedded systems and firmware that can be utilized by these, by these smart, smart devices and sensor-based networks. Um, Another application, agriculture and water and water usage. We have a huge challenge of water consumption in the different parts of the world. Coming back to Egypt with the Nile issue that, that we all know, um, water consumption is on the rise and water uh, influx from, from Ethiopia and other parts of Africa is, on, uh, is, is, low, is being lowered. Um, so utilization of, of water in the most optimal sense is, is mandatory now. It's a life, life and death issue. But the, 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 the farmer habit of using, using water is using it as a exists forever. So here, mechanisms that have to tailor to farmer habits have to be taken into consideration. Again, a local solution is best utilizing technology that comes from abroad, but tailored and hopefully developed in, in country for the medium term is, uh, is a must. And see it again as an opportunity um, to help develop technology in a faster pace. I agree, then, then maybe my last point <clears throat> is that um, the, the challenges of, uh, of particularly on, on the privacy and big data will be much larger than, than we have seen with social media, but the sheer number of volume of devices and the sheer number of users and user habits that, that, that will be there, and I think this will have um, an impact on the, the policy issues that, that relate particularly to, to, to privacy and usage of information more, much more than we are seeing, are seeing today. Okay, thank you. Before um, I, I give the floor back to Michael because he wanted to react to this, I, you know, 
You have to floor and you have to floor and then Michael can just, react to both. Just, just yeah, one and a half minutes. So I just wanted to uh, to continue. Uh, yeah, from from a uh, sense point, uh, there were services uh, right there, right? And so that's actually how it works, you know, with with the things. So things they provide data, and actually after the data aggregators, so they should utilize data properly according to some regulations, which we should think about uh, to provide services, and uh, which should be studied case by case. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's up to you, and then you. Thank you very much. I am Maria Badia, a member of European Parliament. I come from Barcelona, Spain. And in fact, I was the rapporteur for the, the Internet of Things, the communication of the European Commission in 2009. And I just want to, to underline what has been said uh, in previous interventions in the idea of uh, the involvement of the individuals and the citizens. I think uh, we, we shouldn't uh, talk more just only uh, Internet of Things as a relation machine to machine or object to object. I think we have to introduce people to people because it is, it is, uh, it, this is something on humans and something that is, of course, this is uh, a magnificent um, research that uh, affects to the human being's life and, in fact, is working very well for many, many issues, making life easy. But uh, I, I think we have not forget that uh, it's not just a machine, it's not just privacy, it's just about uh, humans and the hu humans and individuals not just uh, using this, but playing a positive role uh, with, with them. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a good reminder not to forget about, you know, that uh, all things at the end end up with individual and people. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm just trying to pick up question from Rafi Damak, I'm his remote moderator, okay? And the question is, why do we need new term for same concept like Internet of Things? Because we have already ubiquitous computing, Internet of Everything, even M2M. It can be confusing if we are going to discuss about governance about Internet of Things. Thank you. Thank you. There are more uh, questions from the remote participation? Uh, yes, that's for the remote participant, only one. Yeah, okay. Then uh, we have three uh, more from the floor. You, you and, okay, you. Excuse me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I was looking on the right side, I come back to the left side. So for first it's, it's you. You have raised your hands already for a couple of times. Thank you. Uh, Joseph Aladef with Oracle. Uh, I think I wanted to build on, well, the, the last comment that was made in the room, um, because I think the misnomer is that we're forgetting to think about the ecosystem. The Internet of Things is maybe finely descriptive for how objects communicate with objects, but the last speaker was right. It's objects interact with objects, objects interact with people, people interact with people in computer-aware environments where they're able to make use of cloud services that are subjected to a higher level of analytics and supported by them, and that's really the environment we're living in. And if you focus only on any one element, you're missing the greater impact on the ecosystem as a whole. So when we think about the, the Internet of Things paradigm, it has to be thinking about it in the context of this ecosystem. And within that ecosystem, we also sometimes fall into the trap of presuming that every object communicates directly to the Internet when the likely scenario is many of the objects communicate to a local area network which actually gives us a control point for governance. And, and that can, you know, the, the refrigerator may be speaking to the house, may not be speaking to the internet, and the house may be speaking to the internet. The Coke can is speaking to the Coke machine or maybe to the sustainable consumption system at, at, the, at, at the trash collection site, but is not probably broadcasting to the internet. So we also have to make sure we're putting those concepts in, in, in context. And then finally, as we think about governance issues and the challenges, I think I would agree with the speakers who said we probably don't need to think of a new law or a new paradigm, but we have to think about how we apply it to new circumstances, and they have to be risk-based. But we also think about how we have to apply it to the fact that there are information opportunities 
whether it be in personalized medicines or other thing, where our current governance models may also be a constraint to the productive use of the information and where we may have to consider that use-based models may in some cases have to supplement consent and things of that nature. So I think we have to have a broad-ranging look and not only worry about the risk, but worry about the lost opportunity as well, because both are important factors to consider. Thank you. Okay, we will take this to our final report. Um, you? Thank you very much. My name is Arda Gerkens. I'm uh, representing the Dutch Society of Computer Users, about 80,000 people. Um, I would like to um, make a comment on a lot of things that were said today. First of all, I think it's true that the challenges on privacy and big data, they're more or less the same as the challenges we are facing now, only we have to take uh, in, in um, comment that the issues only will be bigger. So yes, um, nothing is changing over there. On the other side, uh, the Internet of Things makes the Internet very um, entangled in our lives and everything we do. And in our lives, we have a lot of consumer rights, which we had fought for for a long time. And uh, I think at this point, the consumer rights might be one of the biggest issues for the Internet of Things. Um, so if you propose me the question, do we need to have this debate on the IGF, I would say yes. Because mostly the Internet of Things or everything which is developed for the Internet or uh, ICT is technology driven. Something is made from, a, from out of a good idea and then it will come to the consumer and the consumer might say, oh, let, it's more easy, it makes our life better, let's take it. And they don't think about the consequences or they think about it too late or they do think about the consequences. A uh, discussion we had in, in Holland where the smart meters were actually uh, thrown out by the consumers because they didn't want it. So I think it's, we need to discuss this, uh, actually this point <coughs> of consumer rights in the debate, taken within the debate for two reasons. First of all, to make sure that those rights are very well implemented in the Internet of Things, but also to make sure that we can go on with technology and that we will not stick uh, with good ideas, but which will die in the debate. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. yeah so this is Vinayak from Security, Data Security Council of India. Yeah. My question is about uh, cost of the data traffic. So who would be paying that? Means end customer would be paying that, or would it be manufacturers of those objects would be paying that, or it could be those who would be get benefit out of this data that would be generated by these things. So who would be paying the cost of the data traffic? Ah, that's a good question. So we have around 10, 10, 15 minutes left. So I would just um, invite now the panel by looking forward. Uh, what would be the two most important things which should be discussed in the uh, next two years if we discuss the Internet of Things? Um, and I start from my left side again, you know, the, uh, our friend from Indonesia. Um. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I representing the civil society in Indonesia. We do believe that uh, the gentleman over there is right. I think we do believe that the Internet of Things has great promise. Yet business policy and technical technical challenges must be tackled before these systems are widely embraced. Early adopters will need to prove that new sensor-driven business <coughs> model create superior value. Regulators should study rules on data privacy and security. On technological side, the cost of sensors must fall to level that will spark widespread use. Personally, I myself expecting the discussion will be around IoT as a potential engine for growth and development. But uh, at this point, with regard to the development itself, I'm afraid to say the blatant truth that um, for us, the developing countries, IoT applies to middle and upper class only. The one who gains direct benefit is, I think, the middle and upper class. Doesn't mean that the poor gets nothing, but as long as the IoT doesn't move to the re real sector, they who live in the bottom of the pyramid, I think it will be very problematic. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. That's really uh, a very good point for a uh, platform like the ICF which is a global thing and has to take everything into consideration. I think that was a very good reminder. I have overseen uh, you for the audience and then I, uh, from the audience and then I come back to the panel, please. Uh, yeah, a very good afternoon to you. 
दिस इज आर एम अग्रवाल फ्रॉम डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ टेलीकम्युनिकेशन गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया एक्चुअली आई है फ्यू कमेंट्स टू ऑफर बिकॉज आई एम डीलिंग इन पॉलिसी फॉर्मुलेशन ऑफ मशीन टू मशीन आई पी वी सिक्स एंड दिस क्लाउड कंप्यूटिंग सर्विसेज आई हैव बीन हियरिंग दिस पैनल सिंस मोर देन हाफ एंड हाफ एन आवर एंड ऑफकोर्स इट्स वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इनपुट्स फॉर फॉर मी टू अंडरस्टैंड बट डेफिनेटली फ्यू रिमार्क्स टू बी मेड बिकॉज फॉर दिस एम टू एम टू टेक ऑफ प्रॉपरली वर्ल्ड वाइड फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल फॉर्मुलेशन ऑफ स्टैंडर्ड्स आर मस्ट बिकॉज अंटिल एंडलेस स्टैंडर्ड्स आर फॉर्मुलेटेड this proprietary solutions would come in and of course uh, later on uh, problems of secure open and interoperable uh, problems may be there because we are facing these things in india we do have uh, 15 pilot projects of smart meters and we uh, we do have around 34 states in the country different different uh, states are having different different vendors to install the meters and they are adopting different different technologies so later on it may be problem of uh, interoperability among the different different uh, service providers uh, who are installing the meters so standards formulation of m2m are um, very essential and of course uh, it may be only ip based and ip based means ipv6 and of course offtake of ipv6 in the different countries are definitely um, very 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 slow so i think the government must uh, different governments in the world must increase adoption of ipv6 um, worldwide so that uh, the problems of individual articles like car refrigerator and different different items to be connected to the net may not be there and third point is this key because this is not the um, uh, applications perspective this is the policy perspective because uh, later on uh, different different things will move across the uh, globe and of course these things are being faced in the cloud services also so at, at least one forum should be there where these things can be discussed and decided globally these are few comments thank you thank you very much so but uh, we are running out of time and i would to give the uh, a uh, panelist opportunity just um, to say a final word and to help us to draft a road map for the next one or two years for activities also probably already now to start the preparation for a similar workshop for the next IGF in 2014 in Istanbul so michael what would your two main issues for the uh, iot road map 2014 Uh, yeah, I just put exactly two issues. So one, uh, we are talking about efficient data utilization, which leads to services based on IoT. So how this should be developed? You know, who are going to develop it, and uh, uh, how it's going to be transferred? You know, uh, to 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 the citizens, to the people, to the human beings. And second issue. Uh, considering you know data and generated by internet of things uh, there will be definitely uh, hot discussions about personal data protection actually probably new definition of personal data considering sensors around us whether it's personal data if we are in the place or it's data for the fire you know services that we are in the place whether it's personal or not so there should be some probably new definitions considering that thank you thank you yarko Yeah so it's been pretty useful discussion I think um I I certainly learned quite a bit I I mean at least from my perspective we still seem to be of the opinion that that uh that you know the ba basic mechanisms and 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 governance principles don't need to change but there's a lot, a lot of work to be done on the application level so I think that discussion just would be useful to have and be able to con continue that I, I'm not sure I have any more specific items to bring up i mean the the tons of topics to talk about i guess thank you hotel thank you very much i've also learned a lot in uh, this uh, very interesting discussion um i would just want to uh, to echo some of the points that were made and uh, my my personal um, opinion is that the the highest priority is to utilize uh, machine to machine communication and internet of things to resolve current uh, current very critical problems that have an impact on on the economic uh, issues of particular countries and my point of view on developing world 
these are real, real problems that require solution and the point is that it are being lots of money is being spent on them instead of being spent to to, uh, to better the quality of life of individuals and here so the funding for such research such such um, uh, fabrication such uh, production is available the key point is the government prioritization the government putting a priority this as a priority to address and build the, the solutions and technologies uh, in-house use utilizing knowledge that can be utilized from from abroad as well um, the, the, the challenge here is to address these problems quickly then you need to build solutions and if standards don't exist as was mentioned from my uh, colleague from India then these will be um, the proprietary solutions um, so standard development is also very critical and you can't afford waiting five to ten years to come up with, with stacks that address um, uh, any new communication protocols that, that will arise uh, in, uh, in this environment and <clears throat> also the privacy side um, again these, these parts of the world who have the need for um, these technical solutions are those who are um, not following really any privacy privacy regulation uh, regularly even if they exist on paper they're not being followed so I think it's, it's quite valuable that we seize this opportunity to, ma to materialize and utilize the, 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 um, the privacy regulations if they do ex exist then we materialize them if they don't exist then they're written with the help again with, with, with international agencies like the OECD with the session this morning we have the same discussion or the big data session uh, earlier, earlier in the afternoon. So putting the privacy uh, framework in place in countries who don't have it who are, who are exactly the countries who need to utilize these technologies much faster than the rest of the world. Thank you. Peter. Thanks. Well, I'm going to be the killjoy. Uh, I think you've completely established that the Internet of Things is something that should be taken off the agenda of, of the IGF. Uh, you've established that there isn't any such meaning to the term. We've had a couple of other terms proposed as alternatives. Um, you've established, I think, quite clearly that it's not actually an internet issue, and it's certainly not an internet governance issue. What you've raised and the questions that you've spoken about are sociological, and they're legal, and they're tax, and they're jurisdiction issues, and the last point was it was about standards. Now, the IGF is not a place for solving legal, sociological, and other problems, and for setting standards. So it brings me back, I guess, to a meta point about the role of, of the IGF. The IG, yeah, exactly. The internet governance, you know, I think we need to distinguish very carefully between governing the internet and governing the people who use the internet and governing the use of the internet in general. And this is clearly all about governing the conduct of people who are using the internet. It's not about governing the internet. <laughs> so we need to think about how we deal with these things. You can't seriously be suggesting that we can go on for years and years bringing up a topic like this where the solution to it is in fact not an internet governance issue, it's a legal, sociological, political problem. If the role of the IGF then should be to surface these issues, the, the solution for the legal uh, and the tax issues, there are global bodies that are set up to solve these issues. The role of the IGF when an issue like this emerges is not to recycle it again and again, draw the people together who can solve each of those issues that we've dealt with. Where should the sociological problems be, be solved? There will be a place. Where should the criminal problems be solved in dealing with this? Where should the liability issues for the misuse of this be solved? The IGF's role should be in collecting and coordinating and solving those problems as the clearinghouse for these things, not trying to set itself up as writing the law for um, the kind of things that we've discussed. So that, that's my conclusion. Thank you very much. But by the way, wasn't this a debate which has helped to clear it? To clear some issues, so was it not, you know, uh, like a clearinghouse uh, debate? Uh, that, that's exactly what I think the role should be. But I think to go on and try and solve the issues that we've surfaced would be futile, particularly as it disrespects the legal and other political and sociological institutions around the world that are set up to solve these problems. The IGF role should be in reaching out and coordinating once we've surfaced the issue. But the suggestion seems to be that if we keep it on our agenda, we will actually solve the jurisdiction problem and the actuation problem and the tax problem and the human problems. And I, I just don't think that's realistic. I think the IGF should be working out how to bring in the experts to solve the problems that we've seen. Yes, I think it's clear the ICF is a decision-making body, but you've brought some steam to the debate now. That's why I'm Janette and Michael, and then the final word goes to Martin and Christopher. And then we have to close the session. Just for the protocol, I would like to uh, have it noticed that there are different notions of internet governance in this room. 
One could, for example, also argue for a broad notion of Internet governance that includes technical, legal, social, cultural, and economic aspects, and that we think of Internet governance as a sort of broad way of ordering that space with lots of different actors and also rationalities uh, playing a role in it. And I think especially also with the Internet of Things, it's important to sort of uh, develop such a broad view on things in order to take notice of all the actors and the various ordering devices that play a role here. Thank you, Jeanette. Michael? Uh, even though Peter didn't agree with my proposal to call it the cloud of things, I want to vehemently agree with what you just said about the fact that most of what we're talking about here is well beyond the normal definition of internet governance. This isn't just mission creep, this is mission explosion. Um, it's equivalent to talking about game box issues and cell phone etiquette. But I do want to say that this has been an incredibly valuable debate, and I'm glad we had it. And I do want to put two issues on the agenda. Wherever we continue this discussion, I do think there needs to be uh, a lot more work on communicating a clear vision of the Internet of Things for the average person. And it can be vignettes, it can be statistics, but there's a clear need to tell people what's coming so that there's less fear and more excitement about the benefits. Um, and, and if you don't like cloud of things, I'd like to propose the any cloud. Anybody able to connect anything, anywhere, anytime. And that does get to this question of where the people are in this network. And it also gets to the other very important point that the gentleman from India raised, which is my, the second item I want to stress, interoperability. We don't want a world where one of my cars is on AT&T, another one of my cars is on Sprint, my garage door opener is on Verizon, and my thermostat is on some other network. I want it all to work together so when the network detects that I'm driving home, the garage door will open, the thermostat will be reset, and it will all just seamlessly work like the any cloud should. Thank you. Thank you. Martin, a very brief final comment. Thank you. A little bit uh, longer indeed, uh, just to point out that the Internet of Things is one of the things that is happening to the world today. It is happening. Things are entering and are becoming more intrusive and more, more present every day. Uh, and if you would even count, for instance, mobile phones and the pictures they take and go on the, the Facebook as part of that, you see how it's a game changer. And I think it's very important that we continue to review how we deal with our society in the light of new developments. And this is certainly a new development that is a game changer. And that's why I vote for keeping it on the agenda. Okay, thank you. Christoph. Yeah, just a bit on that. I think, I think it's, uh, it's here already. Uh, every one of you has a smartphone in its, in its uh, back. Um, this is connected to something, and these things are very clever, as we know. You know, they can collect a huge amount of information about you. And, uh, I mean, we have studies that show that uh, average persons using smartphones um, never switch them off, and it never, it's never further away than one meter from that person in any point of time. So, um, it's here. Okay? The Internet of Things is here. These are connected devices to the Internet. It might increase to others, but it's here. So I go back to the point, this is nothing new, okay? But I would like to end with a little more positive uh, aspect. I think we haven't talked a lot about opportunities, and the opportunities are huge. We know that from a social and economic point of view, having smarter networks and all these things will help us, you know, really coming over a couple of challenges we have as humanity. And I think we should therefore, you know, really have a positive also view on these things. Uh, yes, there are risks. We have to deal with them, especially security and privacy is, is top of the list. And the internet connection issue, to be honest, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not so much concerned if there are different operators, uh, you know, giving, uh, giving you something, because in the end, we have a very nice telecom system which is interconnected in the world on standards. Um, there's a very good system uh, which runs the internet, which is also interconnected on a global level. So I think we have a couple of very good standards and platforms to build on um, to run these systems. Thank you. So um, let me conclude just by 
summarizing my notes, what I have here, I have seven points which probably could help us to draft the roadmap, the IT roadmap for 2014 within the IGF. Um, the first thing is there are incredible opportunities, but the opportunities are not without risks. Second point on my list is the Internet of Things is just an extension of the existing Internet, so it's not a new Internet. The third thing is there is no need for a clean slate approach. The existing environment enables us to do a lot of things which are coming out from the Internet of Things. My fourth point is that privacy, security, competition, and um, consumer protection, consumer rights, are probably key key policy issue which are related to the Internet Things and has to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis uh, and not in a very general way. Um, while we see um, a great development on the hard side of the problem, so we have not yet really discussed the soft side of the problem and all the implications. And then, um, you know, what uh, Michael has proposed, we have to really to communicate to the broader public um, division of the IoT what it is so that we move from fears to facts. So that means uh, a fact-based policy is always better than a fears-based policy. And um, so, and the final point here is the interoperability we need so that we, uh, even if you have probably different system for different objects, so at the end of the day from a user perspective, he wants to have just, you know, this uh, one click serves all situation. So that means probably we have to have, do something also in the background to enable this ubiquitous communication. So I thank very much the, the panelists. I thank very much the audience. So I have apologized for some changes uh, with names in the program. But the good thing with the internet is that it allows all types of flexibility. And we have demonstrated that we can react in a very flexible way to a changing environment. So I announced already that we will have tomorrow afternoon um, a dynamic collision meeting of the Internet of Things where we just want to specify a little bit more uh, what the roadmap for 2014 could be. You are certainly and cordially invited to follow this and uh, Sandra managed the, uh, um, the email list for the Internet of Things. Avri is uh, the co-interim chair for this. It means if you want to talk to them directly, they are both here in the room and you can meet them also on tomorrow afternoon. Thank you for coming and enjoy the rest of the ITF. Sorry? Oh, um, Santa, do you, do you know it? It's, 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 it's in the program. It's uh, uh, the. Um, Nusa Dua One. Uh, okay. Thanks.